All right, Tom, thanks. First of all, I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, take this uh, call. I know you're super busy and I'm sure you have more important things to do. And uh, truly appreciate how you always answer people's emails. And I mean, I think at some point I sent you three emails in one day and you responded all in the same day. Cool. Which I think, and uh, like it really, I think um, I truly like, I think you truly deserve the successes that you have. And I, I sincerely wish you uh, more success to come. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I just wanted to chat. Uh, I saw you on uh, Kamikaze Cash, I think, a YouTube channel. So when I saw you, I thought it would be a good idea to chat with you as well. Uh, I'm an active option seller as well. I've been watching your, I've been watching Tasty Trade for, uh, I think, since 2018. Cool. I've watched a lot of the rising stars um, and I've learned a lot through option selling. Uh, so I guess uh, the first thing I guess we can start with is tasty works in Canada. I know uh, you've been asked often that question. I heard, and I heard on that, on the Kamikaze interview that you said you had to even like, ha like you spent $10 million in your own clearing firm or something like that. No, what we what we've done is we've spent a fortune to get licensed in Canada. We're we're basically all done with our with the tasty work process through the regular regulators. We're but we couldn't ha get anybody to clear us. So now um, we've worked with Apex, which is our U.S. clearing firm, to um, uh, to go through the licensing process in Canada, so um, they can get up and running as an independent clearing firm. They have they have. Um, a few hundred correspondents that's those are correspondents are like broker dealers bds in the u.s and a lot of them would like to do business in canada but none of them can because there's no independent clearing firms in canada that are really easy to do the kind that, that take the kind of business that we do futures and options things like that so and none of the big banks really want to clear us so we have worked it out with apex where they're going to go get licensed in canada and they hired a ceo and a team and they're in the process of getting that done as soon as they get approved um you know we're already connected to them we can go live in canada so um tasty works have clear through apex and then there'll also be other us you know bds that'll be able to go live in canada once you know once apex gets approved so it's a good thing for canadian traders so, so now it's in the hands of Apex. It's, there's nothing on, on the Tasty Works. It's in the hands. Of, there's nothing left for Tasty Works to do. It's in the hands of the Canadian regulators to approve Apex as a clearing entity. Okay, and, there's, and you said Canadian regulators don't want to don't want to take the business of that would come with Tasty Works. Is that it? No, no, no. They're going to take. They're going to take. They're going to. They're going to approve Tasty Works. We just don't have a clearing firm, so we don't have anybody to clear through yet in Canada, because the Canadian regulators don't let you do business in Canada and clear in the U S you have to do everything in Canada. They don't want the money leaving Canada. Okay. And you can't use like a clearing firm that already exists here, like a TD. No, well, TD won't clear us. Oh yeah. Okay. So they have to agree to take our business and they don't have any interest in our business. And uh, so how much time do you think it will take approximately? We're hoping, we're hoping it gets done by, you know, end of third quarter or fourth quarter of this year. So end of the year. And, yeah. uh, okay. And, um, and you had mentioned before that it was, you were just waiting to travel. Is this still a concern? Is this still well, the issue? travel restrictions are still in place. So U S citizens cannot travel to, I don't know what, I don't know if they've lifted the rules, but mm -hmm. I don't think they have, um, relaxed the travel restrictions yet. Um, I'm not sure either, but it's, that's not an issue anymore. Um, it's still an issue, but we were able to do the, like a lot of the in-person requirements over zoom. Okay. With the regulators. So it's, I don't know if we have to make one last presentation in person, but um, I believe, I believe Canada still has, unless you get an exemption, which is really hard to get. I believe there's still the travel restrictions are still in place in Canada. I know they are in the UK and other places like that. I think, I think for business, it's, I think for business you can travel if it's I business think related. And for some, if it's if you can prove that it's a necessity and things like that. But it's for us the the Apex team is already in Canada, so okay. it's fine. Yeah. Okay, so it's just a matter of uh, matter of time. But okay, 
And will will Tastyworks have all the different accounts, like registered accounts, like TFSA? Um, at first, we will not. We will only have individual margin um, okay. on day one, but they'll have registered accounts shortly thereafter. Okay. And in Canada with Questrade, we have something called margin power, where they link your TFSA to your margin account. So it's like, I guess, in, in the States, it would be linking your Roth uh, RRA to your margin account, and it gives you extra buying power in your margin account because the Roth IRA is leveraged. Is this something that Tastyworks could do or will do? I don't know the answer. It depends on whether Apex will allow that. On their, their current technology, I'm guessing, does not support that logic because it doesn't exist here in the U.S. Okay. So I don't know if it's something they have to build and if it's worthwhile building, I mean, maybe we can have it built at tasty. We don't care. Like in other words, if it, if you, if, if the Canadian regulators allow it, um, we wouldn't care. Like in other words, we would be all open to it. It just depends on whether apex can figure out the capital requirements and can clear it. Okay. And will the fee structure be the same? Yes, exactly. Exactly the same. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Right now, so the fee structure, the fee structure will be way cheaper than you're currently paying in Canada. Absolutely. And, yeah. and you're also going to get a crazy amount of additional functionality and futures and you know and digital assets and everything else that you know that we can. Everything that's allowed, we'll bring it to Canada. Okay. But we'll start off first with a margin account. But first Apex needs to get the approvals. Yeah, you'll have everything that we currently have in Australia. Um, because Canada is similar to Australia from a regulatory side, and we currently have everything in Australia except the registered accounts, but okay. all the products and all the strategies. Okay. And okay. And speaking of strategies, I'm trying to understand what your strat what your main strategy is. What I understood is it's mainly a short strangle at around I don't know thirty delta on each side, and then you constantly manage Delta as the stock moves. And sometimes very often you go inverted. Is this correct? I mean, that's that's fair. It's, it's usually a little bit wider than, um, so I would say yeah. 20 is probably more accurate. 20 on each side? 20 on each side. You start off with that, okay. Yeah, I mean, an ideal world for us is between 16 and 20. Okay. And 16 and 25, I guess, would be the kind of the widest. It's pretty rare for us to go to 30 Delta unless it's... Um, unless it's a really cheap stock. But for most stocks, we're in that 16 to 20 range and occasionally 20 to 25. So, but why do you constantly manage Delta? Um, just because most of the time, if I'm gonna take risk, um, I'd prefer to take it with static Delta in one of the indexes. I think it's a better, like if I wanna get short, I'd rather do it in an index as opposed to you know using an individual stock where I have less you know overall market control. Like generally speaking, when I when I get short and the mark goes down, I want to be right. Or when I get long, the mark goes up, I want to be right. And sometimes with individual stocks, it's a lot harder to do. So I prefer my static delta to be in indexes where my dynamic delta, you know, around strategy, I'd rather do those in individual equities. Yeah, because I noticed very often you end up being inverted and as if it's as if it's not a big deal. And like even your follow me trades on Tasty, Tasty Trade app. Uh, yeah, like most of your trades are just like adjustments. They're mostly delta adjustments, the ones that you. Well, I, I make a lot of opening trades every day too, but then I make a lot of adjustments too, and I make a lot of closing trades. You know, it's, it all goes. It's all part of the mix. But yeah, you're right. And so um, for me, it's just it's a it's a it's a nonstop you know engagement, um, and I try to keep my deltas you know a little bit short across the board from top to bottom. And so when I get too long, I adjust down. When I get too short, I adjust up a little bit. But I try to keep my deltas wrapped around neutral with a little bit of short delta across the board. And then I, and then I put my, my big directional positions on in the indexes. And that's pretty much how I trade. So, yeah. So, so you don't mind selling, like, selling calls on red days and then selling puts on green days like Usually there's a bigger edge if you sell puts on red days because then your short strike is going to be a bit further and then selling calls um, on I green days. I personally prefer to sell puts into weakness and sell calls into strength. So yeah, I, I do prefer to sell puts on red days and calls on green days. I mean, in general. Yeah. Um, but, but when you delta adjust, you don't, that's the opposite that you're doing. Different. 
Yeah. I'm totally indifferent at that point. I just, I'm adjusting Delta. I'm not worrying about red or green. So you're, so I guess it's, you're assuming that you'll be collecting so much credit that your break even is going to be so wide, even if you're almost inverted or. Or is I'm that, just is, my deltas. I have found that throughout the years, I, I don't really, you know, like, like I have a lot of positions on probably, you know, close to a hundred different positions. 95% of them, I couldn't care less about the underlying. It's yeah. just a position to me. Yeah. So without any kind of emotion attached to the, you know, without any personal attachment, any emotional attachment to the trade, I'm just trying to stay Delta neutral and collect the money. Okay. And obviously if, if it wasn't worth it, PL wise, you wouldn't be doing it. Right? If it wasn't worth it, PL wise, I, yeah. Why would I do it? Yeah. So it, it's a, it's a good idea then it's a good strategy to. Well, it implement. works for me. I can't say it works for everybody. It's, it's a little capital intensive for some people, but for me it works. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of, well, I guess probably not, it's, not, it's probably not a factor for you, but what happened in March, 2020? How did you manage March, 2020? Not well. I mean, <laughs> I was short, I was short going into March. So the first part of the move was really good for me because I had a lot of short deltas, but then eventually those short deltas t- turned into long deltas. So it wasn't great. So you, you started, you, in, I guess in February you had strangles on and in then February what- I had, I had strangles along with short Delta. Okay. And then when the market, when your put got breached, you just when kept your puts it? got breached. My Delta turned from short to long. So I had to keep rolling down. So I had to aggressively roll down because the market got lower. The market went lower than I thought it would go. Did you roll down the put, the tested side, or you just rolled down the call and brought the call inverted? I rolled down the call and went inverted. Okay. Okay. And then when, I guess when there was 21 days remaining, then you decide if you want to roll the whole trade or, or, uh, or close it for a loss. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And were you still opening trades, new trades in March? I was, I was, but I got hurt in March of last, in March of last year. Yeah. Yeah. Because we went down more than I thought we would. Absolutely. Yeah. The first 10%, I was good. I'd made a lot of money. It was um, when we went from 3,300 to 3,000 in the S&Ps. Yeah, I had them pretty good. But when we went from 3,000 to 2,500, that's where I got caught. You know, I, I, I wasn't trying to be long, but my positions just got me long. Okay. So can I ask uh, return-wise? I mean, it's a question you ask to all the rising stars. Uh, in 2020, percent wise, what, w- what would you say your return was, even with uh, even with March? If, if in, in 2020, yeah. Um, so, one of the things that we do at Tasty, which is I'm very careful about this because we have so much um, uh, we have so much oversight, and so we haven't discussed returns on this network for 11 years, 10 years. And, but I'll explain why. Yeah. The reason is, um, I run a highly regulated business and I don't, I talk about what I do, but I don't talk about returns and money ever because I'm going to go back a little bit in my history. Um, I faced in a few years ago, about 2006, we bought a company called Investools. We merged with them. Do you remember Investools? Yeah, I watched the, yeah, I I watched the Karen, the super trader videos. Yeah, well, that's where she started originally. But that that was a big investor education company that we merged with back when I owned Thinkorswim. Well, five years before that, in 2001, I had an instructor that gave his returns out to a class. Yeah. He wasn't audited or anything like that. He just he just told the class. Now we didn't buy them till 2006, or merge with them till 2006, 2007. I didn't even know about them in 2001. But this guy made a statement in class. You know, blah blah blah. I made X amount of money. Yeah. It ended up costing us about close to 25 million in legal fees, 10 million in other fees and fines and all this stuff, and about a quarter million dollars, quarter billion dollars in market value, because we got. The SEC got involved in all this stuff. Somebody complained, blah, 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 this. Said, you know, this guy said he made this, but he can't prove it, blah, blah, blah. So ever since then, it's starting in 2007, we've never said a single word ourselves about okay. returns because 
because it wasn't worth it. And when we built Tasty, we made it, we kind of had a rule at this firm. Nobody that's on air is allowed to discuss returns because we're, we're not audited. We don't want to go through everything. And it's not, there's no, there's no upside for us okay. other than, you know, we don't want to deal with, you know, potential litigation and everything. So we talk about strategy. We talk about the things that we do, but we never talk about, you know, how much money, you know, we, we might say that something on a trade, you know, like, listen, I took 50 cents out of this trade or something, but we will never talk about how we did overall ever. Well, yeah. Well, the purpose of my question was to see if option selling, even in a year where we had like the worst three weeks ever, if it's still something that's worth it, if it's still something. My that... worst, my worst period of time, believe it or not, my worst week or two weeks um, was not in 2020. It was worse for me personally, a worse move was the GameStop move in January of this year. Yeah, yeah. That was a worse move for me. I've had two worse moves than 2020. Yeah. 2020, March of 2020, um, we made money from February to March and then lost money from March to April in 2020 because that was just, that was that weird move. But the two, over the last couple of years, the two worst moves for me were the GameStop move of January 2021. You know, when it went from like yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, 50 uh, bucks to 500. I, I think you, and, you yeah, I, you said how much you lost as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a bad move. I didn't say, I'm not saying how much I lost, but. Well, you said it already <laughs> in your well, I made I it back. La last call or first Yeah, call I made or... it back. It was, a, it was an ugly move. It had a lot of digits yeah. um, and, <laughs> and I made it back and it's okay. But also um, the Zoom move. Yeah. In, I don't know if you remember this, but the yeah, Zoom yeah. move. It was in the end of 2020. Yeah, when it um, went to 600 almost. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. That move in Zoom, because I was playing it at the time, was the worst move for me than the whole March, April of 2020. Yeah. So Zoom followed by GameStop. Yeah. Uh, the Zoom, we didn't make it all back. The GameStop, we made it all back. So with the Zoom, I was about to sell a naked call for before earnings. That The day, I think it went from 300 to 450 after earnings. Yeah, it went, went from like, it was trading like, I want to say it was trading like 360 or 380. Yeah. And it, it went, traded up to 450. Then it traded over like almost the, up to 600. It went over the available strike at some point. Yeah, yeah, weren't yeah. even available strikes and then yeah. they came. But yeah, so I think after that time, I didn't take the trade. But after that time, I, I realized I'm not selling calls anymore. I'm not selling naked calls. I, I, I stick mainly to puts. I sell puts on red days. And just because on the on the call side, I realized that there's no there's no limit, and it, as as you saw with GameStop, so well, you know th th we've never seen that before. In all the years I've been trading, I yeah. mean GameStop, we ran out of upside calls too. You yeah. know, remember when the stock got over five hundred? I think the the one day I think we were trading it, and the biggest call was like maybe two two fifty or something. The stock was trading like three fifty or four hundred. It was crazy. <laughs> The cheapest call was like three or four hundred dollars, but but in all my years of trading, yeah. the only time I've never seen offers have have been on the put side until those moves. But you you were aware like what was there was a bit of stock manipulation or a bit of a short squeeze. So why even play it? Why did you feel like you had to play besides the crazy premiums? But well, listen what? at five hundred percent volatility. <laughs> um, I have to take my chances. That's my, that's my, yeah. that's my business. That's what you said. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, like, like if it, if it was somebody that wasn't in this business, you know, I would say, yeah, you're out of your mind for playing this, but this is my yeah. life. You know? um, there was a trade I made in GameStop where the stock was trading. Uh, actually, I will not forget this. The stock was trading at about um, uh, wrapped right around 400. And I was short the the 100 puts and the i want to say the five right around the five i'm sorry we were short the 100 calls and the 500 puts i was inverted <laughs> 100 calls 500 puts yeah 400. and and i want to say that that spread which was inverted by you 400 know points, 400 yeah. points inverted was trading for like 
it, it could have been as high as, let's see, it was 400 inverted. I, it might have been 700 or 800. Like, it was a crazy number. Like, the stock had basically have gone down. You know, I was I was pretty much protected everywhere. Like, I couldn't, it, unless the okay. stock went over, unless the stock went over 1,000, I couldn't lose. Okay. Because you could have so much credit. This, yeah, and the credit was ridiculous. You know, I had like four or five hundred hours worth of credit. Okay. And and I'm looking at this trade, and I had it on pretty decent size. And I'm looking at this trade. I'm like, unless the stock, unless the stock's going to a thousand tomorrow, which I didn't know how it was going to. And and I understand that most people could not afford to put that trade on. I'm like, how do you lose? The next day it came in one hundred thirty dollars. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy. It came in one hundred thirty dollars. I've never made one hundred thirty dollars on anything in my life. Okay. So that's why you're comfortable going inverted, because you know that you'll collect enough credits to. Well, uh, I, I was I was totally fucked at that. Point. I mean, <laughs> I was short the 100 calls, you know, and at that point I had to sell the 500. But I mean, I was dead. There was nothing I could do. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't like I did it on purpose. Yeah, yeah. I think starting the trade was a mistake. Uh, to begin with. I started the trade because opening the trade. Yeah. The stock. I remember it. The stock was trading about. But why not? Dollars. Why not? Why not just a call spread or an iron condor? If you really well, want of to course, play. in hindsight, I wish I had. <laughs> but at the time, I started with a ratio spread, so the stock was trading about fifty bucks. So, and the premium was out of control. Yeah. So I bought some eighty calls, and I sold the two hundreds like on a four or five to one ratio. I okay. thought it was the layup of the century. I didn't think the stock could go from sixty bucks to two hundred and fifty in one day. I just didn't yeah. think it was possible. Yeah. Never seen yeah. anything like it. Well, I think um, I started selling options in end of 2018. I was doing mostly covered calls and then I switched to spreads. And then just recently this year, end of 2020, I started doing more naked puts and I've been more successful with naked puts, more consistent as well. And whenever it's breached, I just roll it. So I sell yeah. puts on red days on quality stocks. And then if breached, most of the time it's a winner. And if it's if it's breached, then I just roll it, and I just make sure I have enough buying power to roll it. Uh, yeah. Like last put I had here was Tesla at a four hundred put, four hundred strike for August twenty. I mean, super easy, super like super safe and easy. I think I open it for five dollars, close it for fifty percent. But yeah, I think that that's the strategy that I stick with. Uh, yeah, mostly. I like that strategy. You know, sell cheap out of the money puts on yeah. on stocks that you like. Yeah, and I mean when they drop on on red days especially. To yeah. give me to give me an extra edge, an extra room, um, of, I like it. of safety. Yeah, yeah, I like it. So you say you make over like eighty trades a day, but is it eighty different underlyings, or is it the same underlying but different trades on the same underlying? Could be. But, today I made today I made one hundred and sixteen trades. I traded a lot of different products, probably fifty different products. Fifty different products. All same types or different strategies or all yeah, some strangles. different strategies. Some I traded a bunch of futures today. Um, I did a bunch of pairs trades. I traded some futures options. I traded some stocks. I traded some a lot of options. I adjusted some positions. I opened some new trades. I was all over the place today. Okay. Because um, I know, like, you have a watch list, so I don't think your watch list is more than eighty underlying. So I guess it's, but sometimes no, from on your, yeah. No, my watch list, it looks like it's probably around 70 or 80 in my watch list. Yeah. Because on your follow me trades there on tasty trade, it's uh, sometimes you have like different, like five strangles on NVIDIA, for example. Is there a reason why you have like. Yeah, I have about probably five or let me see NVIDIA. I can tell you. I have. Um, yeah, NVIDIA, I have a lot of strikes on. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I, I have 12 strikes on in NVIDIA, 12 different strikes. So, 12 different strikes? So, okay, but sometimes it's open the same day. So what's the reason? Is it just because it, it moved a little bit? So you're for you to completely different Yeah, maybe. Trade? Maybe. <laughs> like like I said, I have, I have 12 strikes in NVIDIA and... Um, you know, they're all, you know, my, my highest strike is 925. My lowest strike is 695. So I'm all over the place in there. And okay. And your goal is still to close for 50%. My goal is to close for 50% or when the Ivy rank gets under 20 ish. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. And uh, okay. And you often say, like I saw you on CNBC and uh, in, in on your live calls, uh, last calls and first calls, you say often that you're shorting the market a bit. You, I guess you're more negative. You have a negative delta. I'm pretty short. I'm pretty short here, and that's been that's been an expensive um, lesson. Um, I thought the market would, you know, yeah. I didn't think the market would get to the levels it's currently at. So. You often talk about the advantage of option selling is that you don't have to pick direction. So, so don't you think that when you're shorting the market or when you're, when you, you aren't you sort of picking a direction when you're, when you're well, deciding when you're shorting the market, when you're shorting premium, you're not picking a direction. When you're shorting the market, you're picking direction. So when you're negative Delta, aren't you sort of picking a direction? Cause you yeah, think absolutely. the market. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm picking a direction right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> No, no question about it. But like most of the time, the market is, we have a bull market, like in 10 years, we'll have like nine yeah, years I know. bull. So I know. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm a contrarian. I do the opposite of what everybody else tries to do. Okay. Okay. And uh, all right. So how does someone, uh, some subscribers asked me on, on, on a video where I mentioned that I'd be chatting with you. Um, they asked how how is IVR calculated with Tastyware? Because sometimes it's different from other brokers or other sites. Does it have a different calculation, or it should be the same? It should be the same. It should be the same. Um, we use the last uh, fifty two weeks, and so it's a pretty straightforward formula. It's just I, implied volatility measured against itself over the last fifty two weeks. Um, the only difference is that our implied volatility numbers could be different than somebody else's, but ours is the most. Um, we do ours in real time. And our calculations are absolutely spot on. We've checked it a hundred different ways. Some platforms, you know, it's old or I don't know how they built it. I'm not sure, but um, I would, I would bet on ours. Let's put it that way. Okay. Okay. And uh, can we talk about Karen or? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So what really happened? Like, did she really lose money or was it, or was she just rolling in? I guess it's viewed on by other you mean with the, you mean with the SEC yeah with the SEC um I do not know the specifics of it yeah I've just you know I've read some of the stuff I mean I've read I too but I don't understand like I don't get what what happened yeah I, I didn't understand everything um I'm a huge fan of hers I don't um you know do you think her strategy is good do you think her strategy is um, good it depends it's not my style yeah I mean, personally, I think her strategy is too concentrated for me. So she was too concentrated in, you know, in, in a specific underlying, you know, the S and P's. Yeah. So it, it makes me a little uncomfortable. It's a little, a little too concentrated for me. Um, what about her uh, management approach? Um, well, so when you're very concentrated like that, you don't have the advantage of high IV, low IV type thing, which yeah. I really like. Yeah. Um, so, so hers is, it's more one dimensional than, than my approach. Um, and I don't like that part of it either, but for her, you know, you have to stick with what works. And, and one of the things that, you know, she did is she got in this business, you know, after the bottom in 2009 and she caught a run for 10 years, you know, so it was a very aggressive, you know, she keeps a lot of long Delta. I wish I kept long Delta, but I keep short Delta. Yeah. You know, so, so I'm always trying to protect against my short premium. She was trying to kind of add to her short premium with some long deltas and it worked out better for her. I, I, I have a feeling that she got maybe burnt on the call side and I think she was just rolling it. And then I, I think by rolling it is she's basically pushing losses to the future. And I, I don't know if that's viewed. I don't know if the SEC would understand the concept of rolling or not. I'm not sure. I don't think they understood the concept of rolling. But you know what? I, I If you talk to her, she's she's very upset. She felt like they ruined her, you know, her yeah. career, her life. And, and if you read what they said, they're like, you know, it was the scheme and all this other stuff. I, I don't know the answer. I just know her personally. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel pretty confident that the person that I know. Exactly. Yeah. Is, is a very special woman who, um, uh, listen, she gave away all her money. She's contributed. She's given her, her life's work to charity. She's not, um, I, 
I believe that she is a genuine and decent person who has, who has gone above and beyond what a lot of us have done, you know, with our lives as far as giving and, you know, contributing to making society a better place. She's pretty, pretty special, pretty amazing woman. I I'm not going to, you know, um, and I, you got to remember, like a lot of people will read what they will read the SEC stuff and read everything. And they'll be like, well, that's not what the regular saying all this. I watched her make a hundred million dollars. We, <laughs> I managed her risk with the team. At yeah. Vegas. With think or swim. Yeah. I, I watched the whole thing. We, we <laughs> watched it day after day. We we're like, we were in a, we've never seen anybody do that before. So, so like anybody that tells me it's all bullshit. And yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I watched the whole thing myself every single day, you know, for a couple of years, um, you know, she was the most successful trader we ever had as a customer. Yeah. yeah, no, her strategy made sense. I just didn't like the fact that she was closing the tested side. Like if it went from five Delta to three yeah, yeah, Delta, yeah. she would I, I understand. It. I understand so, she had her own, she had her own style. Even the guys in the pit couldn't believe it. They're like, it's not freaking possible. Like I used to get calls from traders in the pit that were like, because, you know, where we filled the orders and from the SPX pit and they'd be like, how is this person making all this money? Like, it's not freaking possible. Like they couldn't believe it. <laughs> they were filling the orders and they couldn't believe it. Yeah. Maybe she got too much attention, which wasn't good. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, listen, um, I don't know all the details. I never invested in her. I never, you know, other than, other than talk to her, you know, I, yeah. I, you know, um, I just really like her as a person and, and, uh, feel she's incredibly genuine. Okay. Well, that's why I wanted to ask you, I wanted to get your point of view. Um, so you've, you've interviewed or you've, um, uh, chatted with a lot of, uh, rising stars. Yeah, sure. Do, do you have a favorite? W do you have someone that you would let you let them manage your money, let them manage your trades. If something happened and for, for some reason, there's, there's a lot of really talented young rising stars and older rising stars that we've interviewed over the years. Absolutely. Um, the person that I would let manage my money, yeah. you'd be surprised. Um, I'm there's, listening. <laughs> there's one kid for sure. I would let Alex, the kid trader manage my money. Alex, the kid, Alex, the kid trader. He's, he came on the show first when he was 11 or 12 years old. Okay. He's in college now. Alex has done a bunch of, you know, um, talks with us over the years. I don't know if he was ever a rising star. He may have been a future star once, um, but I would let him. He's a he's a really brilliant kid. He's a sophomore, junior. He's a junior at Cornell this year. Um, he's he's totally clear of the concept. Okay, and his um, he's going to be he's going to be a major hedge fund manager someday who's going to he'll be another um uh he, he he's going to be something special someday okay and his his main was he talking about strategies when you met him like does he i'm uh, sure he does he understands all the strategies but he's he's even you know i mean he's written his own code he's you know he's he's a smart ridiculous okay. smart kid who's who is does a you know he's a trader junkie okay okay so you've talked about your worst trade which is uh, which was gamestop and zoom what would be your best trade that you can remember um ever or just talking about like last i, I guess years? yeah i guess last two years i think ever would be too too yeah too hard so <laughs> something that you remember quickly like uh your best trade yeah. So my best trade, um, let me think of my best trades of. I, I'm, probably has to do with earnings. Yeah. You can close probably. them so quickly. <laughs> N uh, I'm not sure. Let me see something. I'll tell you where my best trade is of this year. Um. I'll tell you my best trading vehicle of this year, but hold on. I, 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 cause I'm not, hang on, let me figure it out. Give me a couple seconds here. Yeah, sure. 
I'm reading through the questions here. <laughs> Well, surprisingly, because I didn't even know this myself, in 2020, my best equities have been Tesla, Zoom, yeah. QQQ, okay. and NVIDIA. Okay. My worst equities this year let me just make sure i'm right about this which is kind of surprising to me actually that those are the ones um my worst equities this year are um and this is surprising list to me as well um uh SPCE, Virgin Galactic, um, the spiders. Probably on the call site. <laughs> the spiders and Twitter. Okay. Which is weird because, yeah, they're all on the call site. So Twitter, SPCE, and SPY, all three of those on the call side are my worst. My best this year, like I said, was um, NVIDIA, Tesla and uh, I forgot and Zoom and those are all on all three of those are on the short premium side. Do you ever do you log your trades? Like do you ever look back at your trades and see what were no. best? No, no, you don't. No, that's why it. I just look now to just to tell you that. So you just said that they were all on the call side. So why not just not sell calls anymore? Is it just because? Oh, because I'm not capable of that. Because okay. I've done way too much research to show that the, okay. the idea of just selling one side call yeah. or puts yeah. is not nearly as effective as selling both sides. Oh, yeah. Okay. Interesting. I rarely ever sell one side. Occasionally, I'll sell some naked puts. Today, mm -hmm. I sold some naked puts um, in UAL, and I sold some naked calls in Target. But I usually don't sell naked calls or puts. I usually sell... Um, triangles both sides yeah makes sense yeah okay and um okay so one of the questions is how, how to play meme stocks i guess you talked about that a bit <laughs> i mean meme stocks are really challenging because mm -hmm. you never know like you know when the emotion's going to run out i mean the only yeah. way i know how to play meme stocks is is by you know is by selling premium but i don't really know you know, when I say the only way I know how to play them is by selling premium, I mean, I still don't know when when the emotion is going to run out, when they're going to turn around. So, you know, meme stocks are tough. But so far this year, except for SPCE, Virgin Galactic, I mean, the meme stocks have been pretty good to us. You know, I mean, okay. we, we've made money in GameStop this year. We've made money in AMC. Um I'm trying to think what we've made money beyond me. So I have like most of the meme stocks have been pretty good to me. Um, SPC is the only one that's a loser. Okay. And you still play the same way with a strangle? Same way. Wide strangles and all of them. Okay. And um, uh, another question here is how would one scale up the volume amount of trades? We hear about yeah. tran tranche sizes, but there's only limited material on tasty trade. Simply increasing the contract counts doesn't seem to work. No, right. the first first thing you do is widen the strikes. The second thing you do is increase the contract size. So if you're doing defined risk trades, you just widen the strikes. If you're doing undefined risk trades, you have to increase the contract size. Undefined, okay. So that's how you would scale up. Would you yeah. add more underlines or just... Uh, would you add uh, more underlines I, first? I personally like to add more underlines, yes. Okay. Okay. And then someone here asked me about, ask him about Delta arbitrage trading deep in the money covered calls, but I'm not sure what he means. No, about Delta I don't arbitrage. like doing, I don't like doing deep in the money covered calls. So deep in the money covered calls are the synthetically the same thing as selling far puts. out of the money puts. Exactly. I'd rather just sell the far out of money puts for more liquidity. So the problem is, 
So yeah, I do I do naked puts in my margin account, but then in my register accounts, we can we're not allowed to sell puts in Canada. That's so in Canada because Canada's yeah. weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I sell instead I sell in the money covered calls to simulate yeah. an out of the money put. Yeah. That's right. In Canada, you're forced to do that. Yeah. That's that is solely a regulatory, you know, they don't yeah. understand. It's all over, yeah. Yeah. It's all the brokers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's that's a regulatory requirement. I, it's a stupid one, but it it, it exists. Um, and um, actually, I, I had a question about an email I sent you a while back. I don't know if you remember, but I asked you about a uh, an arbitrage opportunity in Costco when it had a special dividend of ten dollars. Uh, yeah, there was no arbitrage opportunity. So here's the thing, because uh, I had asked you often, so I didn't want to go back and forth because I didn't want you to get tired, but. The stock was trading at around, I don't know, like uh, 360 mm -hmm. uh, and the put option for that ex for the same week expiry at a 280 at a 360 strike was about four dollars. The dividend was ten dollars. So why was there why would there no, be no arbitrage opportunity? Because I'm protected if if Costco drops, I paid four dollars like I'm protected at the same strike. It's a guaranteed six dollars. No, Correct? you were saying that the next day everything's going to be adjusted. But I didn't know what you meant by everything would be adjusted. If I'm holding yeah. the 360 strike put for four dollars, I paid four. Well, there's no, there's no. It, when you have a ten dollars special, it was a special dividend. Yeah, a special dividend. Yeah. So all the strikes get adjusted by ten dollars. What What does that mean? What do you mean gets adjusted? So get, there's it'll no, be worth. It'll be worth fourteen dollars, or no, your 360 put is going to be 350 the next day. Oh yeah, they can change the strikes on me. Yeah. Wow. That's a first. So a regular dividend, the answer is no. It, it would be built into the option prices. Yeah, but exactly. A it's a special dividend, only a one-time dividend, so they just adjust the strikes. That's amazing. I didn't know that. So that's what you meant. Okay. Yeah. Good thing I didn't take the trade. I thought it was an easy $6. No, no, no. There's no such thing. <laughs> okay. And why don't you put more videos on the YouTube channel? I mean... You have a lot of videos on the Tasty Trade Network. Why not just put all of it on, on YouTube? We try to put a lot on YouTube. I don't know why we don't. I mean, it's up to our production team. I think they put a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. Okay. Who gets the AdSense money? Who gets the what? The AdSense money. Oh, I don't know. I mean, the firm, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Let me just go through uh, the questions here. Uh, so my understanding is that one of the tasty trade strategy main criteria is high IVR. What are his criteria advice in a low volatility market? There's still plenty of high IV, you know, yeah. high IVR stocks in low IV environment. And in individual stocks, yeah. Yeah, and you, sure. And you've got earnings as well, yeah. Yeah, between commodities, earnings, you know, there's plenty of individual opportunities. Okay. So it's just harder to find, but there's still opportunity. Yeah, of course. Everything's harder to find in low IV. You know, the, the risk the risk goes up in low IV. All right. So someone's asking, when is the best time to roll uh, a strike that's that's uh, getting tested? Is it best to roll after breached or take action early? No, it's best to always optimal to take action early. So the earlier you can, the better it is. But I think they're asking roll the tested side or take action on the whole trade and roll the untested. What do you mean no, by you, take action? The first thing is you want to do is roll the untested side. You never need to test the you never need to roll the tested side. Never touch you the only tested need side. to roll. You only need to roll the untested side. Okay. So tested side you leave as is, you play around right. with the untested side. That's right. And then at 21 days, then you decide if it's worth rolling or closing. Or if implied volatility craters and at that point is low. Okay. And someone's, someone has a question regarding the poor man's covered call. Um, so is it better to buy a leap deep in the money or at the money? And what's the ideal duration for the leap? And also, Nine, yeah. Anywhere between 70 and 90 days is ideal duration, no longer than 120, no matter what. And at the money or one strike in the money. At the money or one strike? At the money or one strike in the money, 70 to 90 days is ideal, no longer than 120 under any circumstances. For the poor man's covered call? Yep. And then what's the best time to sell the leap? Better to hold on to it or sell if it gets too deep in the money? Now, don't worry about it getting too deep in the money, but um, because then it just becomes like stock. 
but you got to keep rolling your out of the money near term call. Your short, your short call. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had one strategy that I wanted to go over uh, with you if you have time. Um, do you have time? I have a couple minutes left. A couple minutes? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'll have time for a few minutes. Uh, two minutes. Okay. I wanted to talk about a spy a put a strategy, a put spread strategy on the spy, uh, which that you open every every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So taking advantage of all the spies expiry. So on Monday, I open a put spread on the spy, 28 days expiry. 20, 28 days till expiry. So from Monday to Monday in four weeks, and then from Wednesday to Wednesday in four weeks, from Friday to Friday in four weeks. Uh and so it's just so you're basically laddering into the market with put spreads. Most okay. of the time they will win, and if they don't win, if one loses, that means spy dropped. So if spy dropped, then the next one you'll open will have a will have a short strike that's further. Vix it will will have increased, so premiums are higher. So the next one that you open is safer, and so on and so on. So it's sort of a way to be mechanical, like. Without ha- it, it all works until you hit March of 2020, then you're out of business. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just depends. You know, you, you, we've been in a bull market for 13 years, so you've had no risk to that strategy, essentially. So, yeah, yeah. you know, when you think about it, you know, you're, you're asking me, well, if I put a bullish strategy on and do it every couple of days, how does that work? I and mean, it's going to work great. You have no risk. But, you know, if the market decides to go the other direction, then all of a sudden you're going to be like, this is the dumbest strategy ever. You know, it really just depends. Yeah, but it's sort of a self-hedging strategy because even if the existing put spread that you open becomes a loser, the next one you open is even has a better chance of winning. And yeah, I mean, if you if you stay really small and yeah, you want to try it absolutely. out, I'm fine with it. But I, okay, but theoretically, I think it would make it just, sense. You need the market to cooperate. Listen, we haven't we've been in a bull market for a long time. There's anything you do with positive deltas. That's a long delta strategy. Anything you've done with long deltas until now has worked out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, okay. All right. All right. I think uh, I don't think I have any more questions. Um, and how to play? How would one scale? Yeah, okay. All right, Tom. Uh, I don't know. Thank you for uh, really appreciate you taking the time today. Of course. And of course. I'm, no we're worries. All, we're all looking forward to Tasty Works coming to Canada. Oh, my God. Oh, my. I can't wait. I'm going to go to Canada and crack open a bottle of champagne when the time is happen- when it happens. Come come to Montreal and I'll 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 treat you to uh what's what's it uh, Schwartz smoked meat? Do you like smoked meat? Oh yeah, I've been to Schwartz. Oh yeah, cool. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah yeah yeah, I loved it. Yeah, um, yeah. That, I sat at the counter. It was great. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and because right now we're paying like five dollars a contract, the five dollars a flat fee of five dollars just to open an option trade, and then uh, seventy five cents a contract. So yeah, we can't wait for that. Yeah, you know, you'll love our stuff. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Totally. Totally, totally, totally. All right. Well, thank you so much for this. And I, I appreciate the, the, the show and the, um, um, and the talk and, uh, we'll stay in touch and hopefully we'll be up there sooner than later. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks Tom. Have a good day. All right. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.